Hello and welcome. My name is Melissa Galasso and I'm excited to be with you today to talk about a brand new SAS, SAS 144, 145, which is updating our risk assessment standards. Now this has been a much awaited standard. We did go through the exposure draft uh, and there were a lot of big changes that were proposed and we see many of them in the final standard. So we're gonna take a little bit of a high level overview because there is a lot of moving parts. This is likely going to be one of those deep dive areas, two, three hours uh, to really understand all of the changes. But we're going to focus on what are the big changes uh, as part of this. So again, this was issued in October of 2021. And again, risk assessment has been a common area for deficiencies for a long time. The uh, uh, Enhancing Audit Quality Initiative focused on this for many years, providing additional training, uh, changed peer review to provide additional context so that people understood the risk assessment suite. Uh, and so again, uh, AUC 315 was the leading source of matters for further consideration at 25% um, for 2020 peer reviews. And so we know this is a problem. Uh, in addition, the ISAs have been updated. Uh, and so one of the goals of the Auditing Standards Board or the ASB is to have this convergence effort with the international standards on auditing or the ISAs. And so ISA 315 already went through and was updated and the new standard there will be effective for periods beginning on or after December 15, 2021. Uh, and so we had the ISA convergence, we had the common deficiency, and it was time to give this a little bit of an update. So what's not changing is the concept of audit risk, right? So we still have inherent risk, we still have control risk, we still have detection risk, we still have the risk of material misstatement, all of that is staying. Now some things will have some changes related to verbiage and terminology, but the goal here was really to clarify and enhance the identification and assessment of the risk of material misstatement, again, to enhance audit quality and to better perform risk assessment. Because the whole point of risk assessment is to tailor your programs so that you do an efficient but also effective audit. Uh, and so what we're gonna look at here are some of those key items. Obviously, professional skepticism is really one of the key focus areas here. And so when we think about this, when you're trying to understand the entity's environment, including its financial reporting framework, the standard really goes into a deep dive on how do you maintain professional skepticism throughout the audit and talks about some of the benefits that you can get out of it, in particular regarding the engagement team discussion. Uh, when I teach risk assessment, I always talk about some of the best practices there to really ensure that we're getting all the ideas and that we're not just doing Sally, same as last year. And then again, you know, a focus that we saw in SAS 143 as well as in 142 is this focus on contradictory evidence, right? Very often we like to explain it away or we like to say things like, oh, that was an isolated incident or that was a one-off instead of really understanding contradictory evidence. And so even during risk assessment, you may find contradictory evidence. They also focused on obvious changes in the complexity around us. Obviously, if you just think about the economic, the technological, technological and regulatory changes that are happening on a daily basis, right? Technology just continues to zoom around. And some of the technology that exists today wasn't even thought of when the, when the risk assessment suites came out. And so as a result, we're looking at things like automated tools and techniques, data analytics. How do we leverage that when performing risk assessment procedures? Not assuming that we have to do the same thing we've always done, but really thinking about how technology has changed, but also regulatory aspects. Right, we've seen a lot of regulation lately. How does that impact risk assessment? And then the economy, right? We just had a global pandemic, and so thinking a little bit about how the uh, business environment has evolved and what that implication is going to be. They also really focus on this understanding the entity and its environment. And I think 315 has always had this concept of if you don't understand the financial reporting framework then how do you really know what the risks are? And so there's a lot of restructuring in this area related to the understanding the entity. And so there is a very explicit requirement to understand the use of IT 
by the entity, whether it's through its ownership uh, and governance, its understanding of its business model. IT is really important. Um, if you've ever worked in industry, which I've had the opportunity to do, and your software went down, like my least favorite words I ever heard were SAP is down, which meant to most people that they couldn't even do their job. There was nothing that they could do. I always found something like filing that could have been done, but very often we are at the mercy of our computers and very often we try to audit around the computer instead of really understanding what the computer is doing. And this really says you just can't do that. You really have to understand the use of IT. You have to understand the IT environment. You have to look at the infrastructure. You have to look at the processes, the personnel and how they use IT as part of this. And whether that's commercial off the shelf product or whether that is a very high end ERP system, right, we're going to have to figure out how inherent risk is going to play into this, right? So when we think about the susceptibility of assertions, right, we're going to have to understand it between the financial reporting framework and we have to also understand it related to the IT system. Uh, in addition, inherent risk factors. This is something that is introduced um, in 143 auditing um, estimates that is now rolled out for all risk assessment, which is now there are inherent risk factors regarding the susceptibility of assertions to misstatement, and we have to now evaluate these risk factors. Now, the good news is many of these risk factors have been in a lot of the third-party practice aids for a number of years as considerations. Now, they're just a little bit more um, explicit about the evaluation of these specific inherent risk factors. And again, a focus on this concept of internal control, uh, regardless of whether you plan to rely on those internal controls. We've been always required, I guess not always, since the risk assessment suite, we have been required to understand the entity and its environment, including internal controls. So even if you do not plan on auditing inter uh, the internal controls and testing the operational effectiveness, you still have to determine whether they have been properly designed and implemented. And so it goes through and really updates each of the components components uh, of internal control. So there are five components. They split them into direct and indirect components. Uh, talk about how some are more entity level, some are more directly related to a specific assertion, and how we need to understand that system of internal control. So we do get a big terminology change here. You will see that they updated the definition to be the system of internal controls, and then they have internal controls as more of the policies and the procedures. They also clarify the requirement to evaluate the design and determine the implementation within the control activities component, because again, that's not changing. It's more of a clarification, but specifically focused again on those general IT controls uh, and making sure that we address the risk arising from the use of IT to evaluate the design and determine whether they have been implemented. Uh, and so, you know, when we think about this, there are going to be these key controls or relevant controls related to IT that we need to focus on. And so when we think about this, a lot of us are like, well, I'm not an IT auditor. And those IT auditors and the CISOs are going to be very busy because they do define the terms arising out of the use of IT and general IT controls. And again, general IT controls are going to be considered as part of this. And again, you're evaluating the design and whether they've been implemented, but it is a risk-based approach. So depending on the, implement, uh, on the ERP system that's being used, it may or may not have more or less risk. Um, there is an explicit requirement that the auditor should determine whether one or more control deficiencies have been identified. Uh, and again, uh, this is really just that stand back provision that says, hey, you know, look to see, is there something that we really need to report here? And then one of the things I think people are going to just have to get used to here, which is what we've been saying for years, is risk assessment is dynamic. It's iterative. It's not a straight line. It is a circle. As new information comes in, you have to go back and refine your risk assessment process. So your risk identification followed by the assessment isn't a one and done, right? It's a constant iterative process. And they really focus on that. One area that they specifically focus on in terms of assessment is that inherent risk must be assessed separately from control risk. Now, most of you are saying, of course, but that wasn't explicit in the extent standard. And there are some firms who said, no, it just says you have to calculate the risk of material misstatement. And we did it all in one step. And so now it requires a separate assessment of inherent risk and control risk, which again is consistent with SAS 143. Again, 143 really uh, foreshadowed what we expected to come out of this standard. And again, it doesn't prescribe a specific method for going through assessment. That's still going to be based on your methodology, but um, it is going to help us with that explicit requirement. 
And then my personal favorite, I think we have some common sense coming back to the risk assessment standards. And again, it wasn't the standard that was a problem. It was really the third party practice aids. It now has an explicit statement that if you have control risk at maximum, meaning you haven't audited the, uh, you haven't tested the operating effectiveness of the internal controls, then inherent risk equals your RMM. So low times high is low, because if you assess maximum or high for your control risk, then inherent risk equals your risk of material misstatement. And that's how it was for a long time. And then a few years ago, most of the practice aids moved to low, high, moderate. And this is saying, no, let's go back to the basics, low, high, low. In addition, for significant risks, um, again, this is going to change the definition here. So significant risk today, talk about the response, right? Requires special audit consideration. Here, we're actually going to focus on the assessment of the risk. And those are going to be risks that are at the upper end of the inherent risk spectrum. So we talk about a spectrum of inherent risk and, and uh, significant risks are just high, right? They're at the upper end of the inherent risk based on the factors uh, that we were considering. And so again, instead of talking about the response, Response, we're talking about the actual risk. And so I think all of this really comes together to say, hey, we need to bring all of these risk assessments up to date and really do the best practices that exist today. Again, for some entities, they're going to be like, this is not a big change. For other entities, it's going to feel a lot bigger. Um, the other thing to note that there are, there are quite a few appendices here. They have appendices regarding consideration for understanding the entity, uh, understanding inherent risk factors, understanding the system of internal control, understanding the internal audit function, uh, and then again, considerations related to IT. So you're going to see quite a few appendices there. Uh, so those also really help. And so because we want this to all to be implemented at the same time, says 143, 144, and 145 are all going to be effective at the same time, which is for audits of financial statements for periods ending on or after December 15, 2023. So 2021, we do the auditor's reporting suite. 2022, we're going to do audit evidence. And then 2023, we're going to do risk assessment, the changes related to pricing, um, and then also our auditing estimates. But again, 143 really foreshadowed a lot of what we were going to see in 145. All right, I know we covered a lot. Again, I could talk about this for two to three hours, uh, but we only had 10 minutes today. I'm a little over. So I want to thank you guys so much for joining me. Hopefully this is a good overview of what you're going to see uh, as we talk more about risk assessment. Have a great day, all. Bye-bye.